Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Uh, we are pleased to welcome. Um, he's been in the insurance industry for a few years, and he's uh, back. He's uh, Bob Meehan, and he is the chief executive officer of Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey. Good to see you, Bob. It's good to see you, Steve. You've seen a few things in the health insurance industry, huh? Yeah, things keep going around, though, like everything else in life. But, yeah, it's been a while. Describe um, Health Republic for people who do not know what it is. Sure. Under the Affordable Care Act, or as some people know it as Obamacare, there was a uh, provision that started co-ops. They were championed by a uh, U.S. senator from North Dakota who was familiar with the co-op concept and far for farmers. And uh, because there were very few new entrants in the healthcare insurance space in most states, New Jersey is a good example of that, uh, the law funded uh, a bunch of these not-for-profit cooperative insurance companies. 23 with, originally. 23 originally with the intent that by the third year of operation, the board of directors would be majority composed of actual customers, members. Mm. Today, of the 23 original co-ops established, how many are left? Eleven are left. And your company's one of them? We're one, we're one of the survivors and we're proud of it. We feel pretty good about what we've been able to accomplish. Describe the original growth when you started out, it's about 4,000 members? Yeah, and, and we got a lot of uh, criticism for that. Only 4,000 members, people had greater expectations. Turned out to be um, serendipitous because uh, Congress in the intervening time cut back funding. So some of the cooperatives who priced their product very aggressively got caught short when funding for one of the safety net protections called the risk corridor uh, pretty much evaporated. And we didn't need that protection because we only had 4,000 members. And today? Today uh, we finished the year at uh, 55,000 members. After open enrollment, we think we're going to come in around 45,000, which is a good thing. Why? Well, one of the things we found is that uh, this is an incredible number. 60% of uh, Americans who are in the exchange nationally. Let's ex explain the exchange. The health. It's the health insurance exchange. You go on and you purchase insurance. If on you're the an individual exchange. and you can't get insurance through your employer or Medicaid or Medicare, you can buy on the internet or through an 800 number, but most people are buying through the internet. Healthcare.gov. Healthcare.gov. And depending on your let's income. Put it up. I'm sorry for interrupting. Sure. Team, let's put it up on the screen. The healthcare.gov site for people who are just looking in for information. Go ahead. Sure. So for people who fit certain income eligibility requirements, the federal government will pay a uh, sliding scale of the premium, which is a great deal for people. Some people can come away with out-of-pocket cost of as little as $40 a month for a pretty good health insurance plan. Um, the issue nationally, though, was that this risk carter was supposed to support companies who took on a lot of membership, and ultimately mm -hmm. the government said they could only pay 12.6 cents on the dollar. That really caught a lot of companies short, but because we only had 4,000 members, it really yeah. was immaterial for us. But take a step back. I mean, again, you've seen a lot of these changes over the years, Bob, with your experience in this industry. The pros and cons of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, how do you see it? I think there, there's um, 
both pros and cons. One of the obvious pros is it's made insurance available to millions of people who otherwise would not have access to it because insurance is expensive. Uh, close to, depending on the state, 70 to 80 percent of the people are getting a premium credit from the federal government. And arguably, the majority of those people would not be able to afford the insurance without some premium help. Uh, most states, including New Jersey, expanded Medicaid for adults uh, who did not have children. Good thing. That it, good thing added millions. Uh, are there things that could have, should have been done in the Affordable Care Act? Yes. A lot of us in the industry think there could have been more focus on helping consumers understand value. What does and, that mean? Well, give me an example of that. Well, good because thing. a lot of people watching this right now are saying, I am confused. One of the it's confusing. One of the classic examples is that uh, the doctor says to you, Steve, you have a family history of colon cancer. It's time for a colonoscopy. You have no idea whether the, the hospital or facility you're using is really the best or the worst. Um, you may not even know what it's going to cost. If you have a high deductible plan, you know it might cost, well, actually colonoscopies under the Affordable Care Act for preventive screening should be free. But still, back to the value thing, do you really know whether you're going to the best provider or somebody who's just okay? Value information is, there's not a whole lot of transparency, yet we expect the health insurance market to work like buying cars, where there's a consumer's guide. And you can figure out that, sure, I'm willing to pay for a luxury car, but I know I'm getting value for it. Uh, that's hard to but, say. But Bob, respectfully, um, and full disclosure, you are one of our underwriters as, mm -hmm. uh, let's just say, some of the bigger uh, folks in your industry are as well. And you know them because you used to work for uh, that particularly large um, company as well. But, but i got to say this. When the Affordable Care Act was put out there, it was said that... It would be like purchasing, oh, you know, they didn't say like a car. Jen Eichlin helped me on this, our executive producer. Then they said it would be like going on, um, if you wanted to do a trip, what's it called? Like you, uh, Travelocity. Tra Travelocity. Yeah, yeah. like you'd, you'd go and you'd say, hey, I don't, I don't want to take this flight. I'm going to take this flight. Like booking a flight. So you made it just sound like it's not that easy. It, well, it is easy to buy, but to find out the value, no way. But on a flight, I could figure out the value now? Well, I don't want to get into the av av aviation. That's a whole other issue. But are you saying it's not that simple? Well, think about this. If you want to fly from Newark to Orlando, yes. uh, chances are that you're going to be on a Boeing 737, whether you fly Delta, United, or JetBlue. Right. So that seat in 21A is pretty much the same experience, whether you're Got in it. JetBlue. And so now the difference is whether it's $230 round trip or $400. I can make that decision. Now, How about on health insurance? Now you go to health insurance and you say, well, wait a second, and here's what consumers aren't doing right now, which mm. is, I think is a good message. Uh, people are buying based on the price of the policy. They're not looking at deductibles or coinsurance or co-pays. Some of them aren't even looking to see whether their doctor is in the network. Um, for some consumers, that's not important. Hey, if you're 30 years old and you don't have a history, any health issues, no big then deal. maybe low price is what you want to avoid the tax penalty. But most of us, those things matter. Uh, especially if you're over a certain age. Uh, and it looks like both of us are. Yeah. Whatever that mystical look at that age stuff. is. You absolutely have to look at that. And it's not just about the price of the policy. Now you're into, can I go to the hospital that I'm comfortable with? The hospital that's in my neighborhood? That's right. Or are, they, or are they going to make me jump in my car and drive 30 miles mm. or more to get to a hospital that's in network? Uh, two quick questions before I lay out here. One, best advice for consumers out there trying to make sense of all this? Well, healthcare.gov has some interesting stuff, but I would encourage them to look beyond the price, look for the amount of cost sharing that they're going to be asked to absorb, mm. and but take the time, if they have health issues, to make sure their doctor, assuming they have a doctor that they're comfortable with, and if there's a hospital they've had a positive experience with, by all means, make sure those providers are in that, that program. There are also websites on uh, the Internet where you can get some entry-level, if you will, quality information. One more quickie. Number one leadership lesson. I've been asking leaders of all stripes this question. Number one leadership lesson you have learned in your few years in the industry is... Treat the people who serve the customers well, and they will treat your customers well. Well said. Uh, I want to thank Bob Mann, who is the chief executive officer 
of Health Republic Insurance in New Jersey for joining us and trying to make sense of a pretty complicated situation. Thanks, Bob. Stay right there. All right, you're welcome, Steve. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Marianne Benninger, who is uh, the president of a wonderful university. It is Drew University. Good to see you, Doctor. Nice to see you too, Steve. For those who do not know Drew, and I've been up and on the campus, it's a beautiful place. Describe it. It's called the University in the Forest, and we call it the forest. Students call it the forest because it's in a natural hardwood forest, but right there in Madison, New Jersey. So right near the train to New York, but this bucolic forest. Yeah, one of our very close friends, the former governor of the great state of uh, New Jersey, also a member of the Board of Public Broadcasting Estate, uh, Tom Kane, former president. Yep, Tom was great president of Drew for a long time. Yeah. Um, it has a very distinguished history, you, but in this particular case, you're here to talk about a partnership with some of the community mm -hmm. uh, county mm -hmm. colleges, Bergen. Bergen and Raritan and County College of Morris and Brookdale. To do what? To provide a seamless transition for honors students, community college honors students will do two years at these four great places, and then they'll transfer to Drew. And instead of having to do a course by course transfer, they can really plan their whole four years. They can get that solid community college foundation and then when they know what they want to major in, they can finish up their time at Drew. And of course it, it helps them on the expense side. Um, from the community college's mm. perspective, their students graduate with that associate degree. Talk about that transition. How challenging could it be? Well, a lot of times, as you probably know, students don't, they don't finish community college in part because that may not have been their goal. They might have wanted some courses, they might want to prepare for a job. So what can happen is they can take course after course and then leave without an associate degree. In fact, that's something I did myself. Well, back so, up. You, what, what, you did what? I took courses in community college. I started in a regular liberal arts college like Drew and I dropped out after the first semester. Very long story, very long time ago. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Philadelphia. So this is down in that area? Yeah, near, it was in Montgomery County where you, I went. Did you wind up in a community college? Mm -hmm. I went to Montgomery County Community College in Pennsylvania. I took a lot of courses. It was where I learned what I wanted to be, that I wanted to be a psychologist but I never finished there. It was a phenomenal aspect of my education and years later I was even the commencement speaker, but I never finished. And so often students, life gets in the way, you, you, know, you have a family or you change jobs and you don't finish community college and students can leave without that associate degree. In this case, we're talking about really, really bright honor students who we want to get mm -hmm. that associate degree but then Drew is there for the second two years. They know that they're going to get a four-year degree and they graduate with that solid liberal arts degree. You connect with these kids, don't you? Oh, very much so do I connect with them. them. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't get to spend too much time in the recruiting end, but when students come to Drew, yeah. I get to know them. By the way, for those who don't really understand the role uh, of a college president, we've had different <laughs> college presidents and uh, Kay Walter, our friend up at uh, Bergen, has been here mm -hmm. to talk about this as well as a presence of independence and public four-year institutions as well. Describe your job. It's a CEO job. I run a corporation. It's a not-for-profit corporation, but it has all the financial parts. The yeah, join the club, same here. Exactly. What, people think not-for-profit, <laughs> oh, you run a charity. That's right. No, you still have to, it's even more important to make ends meet because you're stewarding other people's money and you're, you need to steward it well. But it's, it's running a corporation and uh, you know, you have this incredible group of people called the faculty, and the, my job is to make sure that they can do what they do best and that they can connect with students. So I have to provide everything else right. and get out of their way. College affordability. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the thing I, I, I said, one of the things I happen to know because I told you this before we got on the air is that our son uh, looked at Drew and, and wanted, and I very much was looking at Drew and said, why don't you go there? And he wound up going to a, another fine institution, Fordham in, mm -hmm. in New York. But 
I was struck by, in all candor, um, Drew's not cheap. No, Drew is not cheap. Um, why? Well, for one thing, it's very rich, human resource rich institution. Faculty do not individually make a lot of money. They have PhDs, but they really don't make a lot of money. But it's very labor intensive. We have one faculty member for every 10 students at Drew. And that's the kind of that's education part of the we provide. And that's atypical for a lot of institutions of higher learning. That's right. Liberal arts colleges like Drew are founded on that notion that students and faculty are very connected. And at Drew, that's really really are claim to fame, which is why it's also going to be good for the students transferring from the community and county right. colleges. But that one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship, the kinds of uh, internships that students do, research, um, undergraduate research. We just had one of our research faculty members win the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and students got right? to work with him. The students worked, Dr. William? William Campbell. And the students worked with Campbell? The students work with Campbell. He actually did the Nobel work at Merck. We're actually looking at a picture right now. In, uh, in 1990, he came to Drew, and countless students worked in his lab. Having a laboratory like that is expensive. But, you know, 96% of our students get jobs or in graduate school when they leave. So the return on investment is The really ROI high. is big. It is. Well, um, one of our colleagues, Rob Franick, who is... Uh, the editor of Princeton Review and an alum of Drew, he says, return on education, ROE. Return on education. Yeah, real quick, before I let you out here, you've said it's very tough times for higher ed, right? Well, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of focus on affordability and the model, the way that we do it, this high tuition, and then we provide scholarships, merit and need-based scholarships called discount. A student at Drew, for example, pays on average about half of that sticker price of tuition, which is half of $46,000 on the tuition side. That's hard for people to understand. Sure. Why would we have one sticker price and then charge a completely different thing? But it's, um, it allows us to you know, kind of construct a price that a student can afford at his or her economic level and a price where we mm. can reward students for academic achievement. Before I let you out of here, um, you've been in many leadership positions and you're in a tough one now. Mm -hmm. um, as a student of leadership, I'm curious. The number one leadership lesson you've learned so far is? Authenticity. You were ready with that right away. No, Why? No, because, well, it's my stock and trade. Right. I mean, you really have to know what your goals are. You have to know what's best for the place that you're leading. And then you have to bring your best self to it. You have to um, really, you know, you have to be present and be honest to people, and then they're gonna they're gonna believe you because you're worthy of that, and they're gonna follow you. And sometimes you have to give hard messages. Sometimes you get to tell people, "Yeah, great, let's go with it." It it just depends on the situation and what you can bring to it yourself. Authenticity. Authenticity. Listen, uh, we appreciate you joining us, um, uh, Dr. Marianne Benninger. Thanks who is so the much. president of Drew University, uh, a terrific place, and we wish you nothing but the best, and thank you for joining us. Don't thank let it be you, the last Steve. time. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Marianne Donahue Ryan, who is the Chief Nursing Officer at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, too. You're also a Vice President of Patient Care Services. What does that all mean, by the way? Anything that has to do with the operations, the daily operations, the, the uh, daily running of the hospital as it pertains to patient care. Yeah. And you've only been on the job for a few weeks as we speak, but you've been yes. in this profession for a while. Why'd you even get into nursing? Way back when, I think we all uh, wanted to be into nursing or into healthcare to do yeah. something right for patients and their families. And yeah. you know what, Steve, that message has not changed a bit today. You know, it's so interesting. A few years back, uh, we partnered with you and the Nurses Association. We actually did a whole nursing week and one on one, and we're so mm -hmm. proud. And you did one of the PSAs. Do, right. do we know enough? Because that's the reason we did that. The reason we're going to do it again is because we want to celebrate nursing. Do we know enough about nurses and who they are and why they make such a difference? I would say we don't, but the Johnson & Johnson campaign for the future of nursing really uh, helped put us on the map, so to speak, in terms mm. of achieving that recognition and understanding. Uh, 
nation, nationally or internationally about what it is that nurses do every day. But it's changed. I mean, even since we did that series, how dramatically do you feel the field of nursing has changed since the Affordable Care Act? I would say that if you're talking specifically about nurses and nursing, the opportunities for nursing have exploded exponentially. And that, of course, the Institute of Medicine is saying that nowhere near will we have the capability of staffing our nation's hospitals or being out in the community to the numbers and to the extent that our public and our population really needs for our nation's health. So that's one, that's the biggest and most dramatic. But in terms of overall health care, the care for patients is really in the community and in the homes as never before. Mm -hmm. So it makes you think back to the to the early 1900s when Lillian Wald was out in the tenements in New York City and providing that direct care. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that has not changed. We really needed to be more upfront and personal in families' lives where uh, real life was happening in their kitchens, around their kitchen tables, around their living rooms where mom and dad were located, et cetera, and it's not in a hospital. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, sure. Doctor, you talk about by the way, you are a doctor, but let, let's make it clear. Your background academically? A PhD in nursing. Boy, that took a, that's a lot of education, isn't it? Yes, it is. A lot of commitment mm -hmm. while you're working the entire time, right? Yes, and raising a family. Yeah, all that, but balancing. But no different than anyone else who ever did it. Yeah, modest as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how about this? Let's talk about the fact that there's a community piece to this. There's something called population health, which is an expression that people talk a lot about. But in many ways, it is community health. Yes. Talk about it. It's really the growth and development of community health is what population health is all about. The metrics, as we look at them in terms of our dashboards and hospitals. Dashboards. You cannot use health jargon here. Dashboards. Metrics. Roadmap. <laughs> For an example. A dashboard is what you see when you turn on your ignition in your car. That's a dashboard. Got it. And each of those indicator lights tell you the health and welfare of your automobile, right, your vehicle before you get in. So very rarely do we ever read the, the owner's manual from cover to cover, right? Right. But many of us uh, jump right into a hospital experience or to a healthcare experience, never reading that dashboard, never understanding anything except that key goes in that ignition and brings you to that local hospital. So that's what a dashboard is. A dashboard tells you the uh, health and welfare, so to speak, of that particular but, hospital. But I, how would you even know that? How, how would you know how the health of the community is based on what the dashboard says. Because there's something called value-based purchasing and that's tied into accountable care organizations. And it is uh, definitely, I would say, uh, not the wave of the future. It's, the, it's what's presently, what presently it is that the patients and families deal with. So mm -hmm. while I'm proud to now be associated with a small community hospital, medium-sized community hospital in New Jersey, uh, it's because uh, we all feel as though we want to contribute to the health and welfare mm -hmm. of the communities where we reside. So it's all happening at that community level. It's, it's happening at the large academic medical centers too because they're their neighborhood hospitals of choice, but never before have the community hospitals been so key to the health and welfare of patients and their families. Another area that you're very concerned about that nurses play a big role is old role in disease prevention. Yes. Talk about it. Well, disease prevention is one of those things that also goes on that dashboard, and that has to do with preventing readmissions. So if we can prevent readmissions, prevent people from coming to the hospital, and seeing a, an admission if it's, if it's uh, uh, not recognized appropriately the first time, that could be seen as a near miss, something that should not have happened. For example? Um, someone who goes home with um, an unrecognized disease, such as um, a, a broken bone that we didn't catch the first time when they were in the hospital, or pneumonia, or any other sort of illness, or, or even a complication from the surgery that brought them to the hospital in the first place. So if we didn't catch that side, side effect of whatever it was that they were going through, or if we failed to prepare them to mm -hmm. be adequately treating themselves in the community with the uh, host of uh, community resources that we set them out for, um, then we've, we've created a problem, then it's our problem to try to fix that. And many times, as we know, insurance, insurers will not pay for um, a failed admission on our part or a failed so, discharge. So the economics are involved as well. Yes, yes. The so, other thing that I'm curious about is physician, nurse, interaction, relationships, communication. As nurses play more and more of a prominent and influential role in the care of patients, how do you feel, how do you sense the relationship between physicians and nurses evolving? 
I think it's it's never been as good as it is right now. Really? And I'm very happy, as I say to my friends and colleagues, that I've lived long enough to see everything come full circle. And our physician colleagues, our nurse practitioner colleagues, our administrative colleagues, all seem to be working on the same page in high performing organizations, of course, which Englewood is, is, is one. So that's the key there. When you look for an organization either to be cared for by your family or to work in, you want to make sure that there's a high focus on quality and team effort. And unless everyone's working together on the same team, uh, the, you won't have the high quality outcomes One that you need to question. see. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, technology impact and all this? Technology is huge. And we're raising, raising a generation of children who are, are Gen Xs, who are our millennials, who are really focused and tied into their devices for whatever reason. How so, has it changed nursing? It's changed nursing because we've had to focus in our early education about breaking yourself away from the devices and speaking to patients one on one in their eyes, looking in their eyes, sit down and talk. Being present. Being present in that moment, which has to do with your philosophy of patient care. Uh, again, which is a hallmark of high achieving organizations. You'd want to see that happen. But many times you've been uh, going to your provider, Steve, and you'll see that the physician or provider seems mm. to be focused on that device or the computer and really turns around to give you that eye contact. And that's one of those bridges that we have to build as we move forward. Last one, Marianne. Uh, you've been in a lot of leadership positions. Number one leadership lesson you have learned in, in these years is? to be able to understand and respect the job that people do whose boots are on the ground every day. And uh, to never <laughs> feel as though uh, you can't pick up a tray and deliver it to a patient or answer a call bell. Um, it has to do with everybody being equal members of the team. Getting right in there. Absolutely, every day. Not above it. No, who would ever think something like that? That doesn't work. Dr. Marianne, Donnie Ryan. Is Chief, Nerf Chief Nursing Officer at Englewood Hospital Medical Center. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, PSE&G, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJM, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Seeing science in action makes students realize they can learn. What is that working out called? Elizabeth. With the right tools, it's easy to motivate students. Students need to know science to succeed in the global economy. That's why NJA established the Center for Teaching and Learning. To give teachers the training to make science come alive and to keep New Jersey schools among the best in the nation. That's why we are so proud to teach in New Jersey's public schools.